Welcome to your cyber world, where hackers rule. The hackers are winning. To fight back, organizations do war games to test their security. Would you like to play a game? Called the most uh, feared computer when criminal. Was captured in 1995, in the definitely the most renowned hacker of our time. Kevin was systematically attacking the computers of some of the world's largest cellular telephone manufacturers. He was able to elude us by virtue of, of knowing the uh, telephone and the computer systems well enough. He was arrested and subsequently sentenced to federal prison time. Kevin, hey, great to see you. I'm so glad you're here. I am, I am so excited about this segment, and I just, I, I just wanted to ask you um, a question to get us kicked off. So at one time, you were the most famous hacker in the world, um, the most wanted computer criminal. What did you do that got you that honor? I hacked into a lot of systems. <laughs> and uh, um, I was the hacker for the adventure the curiosity, the pursuit of knowledge, the seduction of adventure. A little bit different from today where hackers are, you know, are after profit. Mm -hmm. Mine was about the passion of technology. And I started, my first kind of hack was actually in high school. And this is where I was involved in this hobby called phone freaking. And a lot of you probably have heard of it. Steve Jobs, Steve Wozniak also had this hobby in the mid-1970s and they built these blue boxes. They sold them on Berkeley's campus. They used the revenue to build the Apple One. Well, I was also interested in this hobby of phone freaking, and um, one of the students in high school said, hey, maybe you'd be interested in taking a computer class. And I was, I go, nah, that doesn't sound too interesting. So eventually, the phone company switches started, uh, they went over from electromechanical switching and step-by-step -step and crossbar over into electronics, electronic switching, and they actually had front-end computers control it, so I became now I became interested in taking computer class, but I didn't meet the prerequisites. So the other student said, show Mr. Christ all the cool things you can do with the phone. So I showed him all these like, cool hacks, and he let me in the class. And then he gave the first programming assignment to find the first 100 Fibonacci numbers writing a Fortran program as the first homework assignment. And as a, as, as a high school, I thought that was kind of boring. I wanted to write a cooler program, and I never coded before, and I decided I was gonna write a program to steal the teacher's password, right? And it took a lot more work than doing the, Fort the Fortran program, and I don't know how old all of you are in the audience, but back then we had an Olivetti 110 baud terminal, 
we dial up to a PDP-1170 running RISTA-C in Los Angeles, and they'd have an acoustic coupler modem. We'd put, dial the phone number, put the, put the phone hand, handset into the modem, and the teacher would always leave the computer connected, and whenever he had to log in, he would type hello, and it would prompt him for his account and password. So I wrote the first login simulator. So mm -hmm. when the teacher went to log in, I wrote the code to steal his password and put it into a file and actually log him in, right? I thought that was a cool program. So eventually he came you know, around and he goes, where's your homework assignment? Mm -hmm. And I go, I didn't get a chance to do it, I'm sorry. He goes, I stuck my neck out for you, I let you into class, even though you didn't have the prerequisites of being a senior, and, I, and uh, I, I'm disappointed. And I said, well, I wrote a cooler program. And he goes, well, what does it do? I said, isn't your password such and such? And his, and his jaw dropped and he goes, how in the heck did you get my password? And I showed him the code and uh, he was quite impressed with it. And he actually dissected the program on the chalkboard for all the other students to see. And I got a lot of attaboys. So back when I started hacking, it was actually encouraged and the ethics taught at the time that it was cool to hack. And this is in 1979. Okay. So that was how I kind That's of got, got started. started. Okay. Yeah. So as a part of the preparation for uh, meeting you, I did a lot of research on you and I watched the movie. Did you turn off your Bluetooth and your Wi-Fi? <laughs> <laughs> no, you but on research, you know that's probably but, the first but, thing to do. <laughs> but on my iPad, but on my iPad, I watched the movie Trackdown, oh and my you God. were you were badass in that. But that, that was all uh, that was all a journalistic license by. Oh, good, because yeah, that, that movie's completely false. Because I was really nervous, and I thought that as soon as you saw all of our mobile agents of change oh my God. <laughs> badges, it would make you a little nervous being here. Yeah. Um, so um, you were a fugitive from the FBI for three years. You were finally caught, yes. and you were caught uh, almost a little over 20 years ago. 20, right. yeah, yeah. So it was uh, Valentine's Day, 1995. Yeah. So yeah, a so, little bit over 20 years ago. And how I was uh, eventually caught is I hacked into this researcher's computer, a guy named Satomu Shimomura, and he worked at the uh, uh, University of San Diego. And at the time, I was very interested in cellular phone technology. And um, I, this guy used to find security bugs. He was into hacking cell phones. So I targeted him. And uh, that's where we came up with the first IP spoofing attack. Mm -hmm. It wasn't known. And myself and this Israeli guy and another guy form this new attack where we could spoof our IP address and basically gain access to any system that was running like Solaris and uh, SunOS, which is Sun Microsystems operating systems. Anyway, I pissed him off, was the bottom line. And then you know, he came after me with the government and they actually tracked me through uh, uh, tracking cellular. Okay. Right? Because back in those days, in the 1990s, I rigged my cell phone so I can dial up into like a local pop or anywhere in the United States and it would be hard to track my location. But as a ham operator, I knew better. I knew it's really easy to go out once we have a radio signal and track it down. I just never thought no, anyone would go to the trouble. And they did, and I ended up, and that's how they got. ended up getting into a lot of trouble. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so um, <laughs> we're going to come to a little bit more on that. So, um, I, but, I, but I did read that um, I believe you were using cellular technology and you were tracking the FBI. So you knew what their heavy move was so that you could evade them exactly. for three years? Yeah, exactly. Like, so I had, a, you know, I, had a, I had a lot of chutzpah back in you know, the 1980s, 1990s. And to me, hacking was a game of one-upmanship. And I played cat and mouse with the FBI. Eventually, they, they got their man. They caught me. But as part of this cat and mouse game, I, uh, I, knew, I knew that they were doing an investigation and so I decided I would try to get the cell phone numbers of all the agents so as they're going through Los Angeles, I'd be able to track their physical location. This is 1990s, this is not GPS. This is old cellular triangulation. So I hacked into Pacific Bell Cellular and got access to their intelligence system. And how I was able to get the agents' numbers is what they call a terminating number search. Is I knew numbers that they would likely call and I would search all the call detail records looking for those. And when I identified those, I was able to find out, well, who did that person call? Who did they receive call for, uh, calls from? And through the metadata, which by the way, the NSA says is completely worthless, but to me back in the 1990s, it was really valuable. And at the end of the project, I had all the cell phone numbers of these agents that were tasked with investigating me. So I had this device that I purchased that I was able to hook up to a radio scanner, to this device, to a computer, and I was able to program in the agent's phone number. So whenever they came into a cell site that was close to me, it would alarm my computer. So I set up like kind of the FBI early warning system. <laughs> 
I should have sold that on the market. But anyway, <laughs> so, <laughs> so I don't know, like a month later, you know, I, I completely forgot about it. I said I've completely forgot about it. I go into an office. I was working as a private investigator back in the early 90s. I disable the alarm for the, for the office. I walk in, and I hear some beeping. And I'm a little bit concerned because what is this tone coming from? I end up going to my office. It's getting louder and louder and louder. I look on my computer, and the early warning system was stripped. And I look, and I go, wow, this agent was in the cell site. And I could see what numbers. I couldn't get content, so I could only get metadata. But I could see that he called a phone number. And I recognized that phone number as the pay phone across the street from my apartment. So I go, uh-oh. That must have something to do with me. But I'm thinking, I'm going, well, they weren't there to arrest me. I was home, right? They could have knocked on the door, hey, Kev, we want to talk to you. Uh, and they weren't there to follow me, because where I work, they pretty much knew. It was public. So I go, ah, they're probably there to get a search warrant, because they have to write the p description of the premises and go through this, you know, the, this process. So they, later that night, I take all my computer out. I take all my floppy disks. This is the days of you know, 3.5 inch floppy disks. I put them at a friend's house. And uh, then I thought, I got to leave these guys a gift. So I go to Winchell's Donuts house. I purchase a dozen donuts. And with a Sharpie, I write FBI donuts on the box, FBI donuts. And I put it in the uh, refrigerator. And then with a big like, post-it note, you know the Intel inside logo of Intel, I put FBI donuts inside. Kind of, you know, the artwork wasn't perfect. I put it in the fridge. And then I just waited, you know, figuring, well, when are they going to come? So actually. 6 a.m. the next morning, I was sleeping in. I hear a jiggling of my lock on my front door. And immediately, I think somebody's going to break in my apartment. I wasn't thinking, because FBI knocks. They don't you know, try to break your lock. And I jump out of bed. And at the time, I slept nude. I, that's a secret. And I jump out of bed. And I go, who is it? Who is it? Because I was nervous. Like I thought someone was breaking my house. I go, FBI, open up. And I just instinctively just opened the door. And a female FBI agent was right in front of me. <laughs> I go, oh my god, I'm so embarrassed, right? Can I put on some clothes? Yes. So they walk you know, into my apartment. They you know, are looking for computer-related stuff. They find none. But they did find the donuts, and they were not happy. <laughs> and they didn't eat one of them. <laughs> so this is the kind of stuff I did, kind of pissed off the FBI, which is, by the way, a stupid mistake. In hindsight, hindsight's 2020. It's, it was a stupid mistake, and when they finally caught up with me, they threw the book at me. So yeah. uh, you spent some time in federal prison, and yes. um, uh, is it true that you were at one time declared a national security threat? Oh, yeah, because uh, one of the prosecutors had come up with this idea that I could dial into NORAD, right, right to their dial-up modems, whistle into the phone, and launch a nuclear weapon. In fact, when I was in court, and the prosecutor tells the judges, I started laughing because I'd never heard of something so absurd in my life. And of course, the judge believed it hook, line, and sinker. So I ended up being held in solitary confinement for almost a year over the myth that I could whistle the launch codes. But I've been practicing. OK. okay. <laughs> so uh, take us back in time, um, because you know, it's a very fascinating story. And um, you said you've hacked from curiosity. Right. And I certainly am, like most people here, you know, I encourage my kids to ask questions, to be curious. But you must have driven your parents really crazy. Oh, yes. I mean, I remember when I started this phone freaking stuff when I was 17, the phone company got so pissed off. Because I would do things like I would change a friend's home phone to a pay phone. So whenever he or his parents try to make a call and say, please deposit 25 cents. <laughs> I thought it was pretty funny, you know, changing a friend's home to a prison phone so whenever they make a call, <laughs> collect calls only, sir. You know, so, you know, they didn't have a sense of humor like I did. So they actually sent my mom a letter, we're taking your phone out. And my mom was livid. And there was nothing she could do. And I said, Mom, I'll, I'll solve the problem. Don't worry. So they yanked, turned off the service. So I go down, I'm, you know, 17 years old. I go down to the Ace Hardware store. Or he lived in the unit number lucky 13, so I, I purchased a 1, a 2, and a B, you know, for 12B. Took, out the thir you know, took down the 13, made by unit 12B, called a certain department in the phone company for provisioning, told them a new condo unit was being added to this property, 12B, so it needs to be provisioned for phone service. The next day, I'll call the business office, and I order phone service for unit 12B. And it was kind of funny, the call, because I never thought this was going to work. So she goes, she goes, may I get your name? I go, uh, Jim. And she goes, last name, sir, Bond. And, um, <laughs> and during the call, we're talking about all the services. And she goes, uh, OK, we have a number for you. And it was a bad number. I go, can, I, can we pick like a, a, a number? I'll pay the extra, whatever it is. She goes, sir. And I go, well, do you have any numbers ending in 007? 
right? And I, I figured she's going to like pick up on this. And then at, at the end of the call, I said, oh, by the way, for, for the billing purposes, do you need my legal name? Because Jim's my nickname. Do you need my legal name for the bill or, or my real name? She goes, no, real name, sir. So at the end of the call, they install the phone under James Bond, 895 that lasted for about three weeks, and then the phone company security department figured that out and turned that service off too. So I think I did, uh, my, I was a challenge to my parents. Yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> Slightly. Uh, so you hacked McDonald's. Oh, that's my favorite hack. And it wasn't for a Big Mac. So what I, you know, I, not only was I into phones and computers, but I was also into radio. I was about 16 years old, and you know, 16-year-old kids could get a little bit mischievous, and um, worked out how to take over their drive-up windows from afar. So imagine I have a more powerful radio, and all the drive-up windows were controlled by radio. Now you have video. They're lucky this wasn't 1970 now, because if they had video back then, you could imagine what you can do you know, for pranks. So, because I was a prankster. So, I would be able to take people's order and communicate with the people, and the guy inside the McDonald's with the headset could only hear because I had a more powerful signal. So customers would drive up, you know, take their order. Oh, you're the hundredth customer today. Please drive forward. Your order's for free, <laughs> right? Somebody would drive up, and you know we're kids. You know I shouldn't talk now. And we could see that the occupants were overweight. You know, make take your order, please. Oh, Big Mac fries, Cokes, apple pie. Oh. You know, based on the weight, uh, weight of the type of car and the weight of the uh, occupants, we suggest the McSalad, right? <laughs> the favorite was when the cops would drive up. Hide the cocaine! Hide the cocaine! <laughs> <laughs> so the manager of this McDonald's, this is in LA, runs out and he's looking in the parking lot. We're across the street. He's looking around at the cars. He doesn't see anyone around. And then he walks up to the drive up window speaker and he actually bends over to look inside. I, well, I couldn't resist. I keyed out. I'm like, what the hell are you looking at? <laughs> this guy flies back about 10 feet. So hands down, my favorite hack. Okay, okay. <laughs> And um, so we're all aware of, of uh, you know, the, the national security threats to um, uh, the State Department, the NSA. You hacked the NSA when you were in high school. Well, I, I hacked their phone system. So because my challenge was trying to get into every phone switch of every phone company in the, in the USA, and this one was in Laurel, Maryland, which happened to handle Fort Meade. And I did this from the computer room in high school is I dialed up into the switch, and through the switch I can, I can do a, uh, a translation that creates a special circuit, which I can call into with a phone number, and, and it will just you know, be a tone. And then on the, on the switch, it was an ESS-1A switch for all those telephony experts in the audience, I was able to command it to list the trunk groups of the Centrex for 301-688-6311, which is the NSA pilot number. I still remember it and uh, see ongoing calls and then command the trunk to connect to my monitor number that I could dial into and I could hear audio. So I did it and I listened to a conversation for like 10 to 15 seconds. I hung up and never did it again. I was just like climbing Mount Everest, right? So I feel, I feel it's okay to discuss it now because it's way past the statute of limitations and I was a juvenile. But yeah, so, okay. so that was kind of like, uh, and it was like, the, the reason I did it was like, well, the NSA are the big wiretappers, so wouldn't it be cool as a teenager to be able to wiretap them? So I, yeah. I just tried it and it worked, and I wasn't right. interested in the content of the call, just the ability to see if I can do it. But for you, it was all about being cool. It wasn't about selling secrets that you no, obtained. No, not at all. You didn't monetize any no, of never the made stuff a you did. Yeah, it cost a lot of, ended up costing my parents a lot of money in legal fees. Yeah. That's, that's, that's really about it, but I never, I made free phone calls, and the purpose of the calls where when I was dialing up into systems, I wouldn't obviously use a phone that's registered to Kevin Mitnick. So obviously, I would manipulate the phone system to make free phone calls that were local, right? So it was like they were free, so but free I'd route it through the calls. cellular system. Okay. So it was actually stealing airtime, okay. right? So, you know, that's a crime okay. and theft, but it, it wasn't about doing it to make any money or to cause any harm. Right. It wasn't I was like the virus writer or the guy that's going to wipe out the data on your computer. No, I was, going to, I was the guy, the prankster, so I was going to sneak in and say, ha ha, I'm here, okay. type of thing. Yeah. Uh, so tell us what you do today. Today you're an ethical hacker. 
Yes, I actually passed the certified ethical hacker exam. I don't have the certificate here, so I'm actually certified ethical. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, it's true, I do have that, but um, no, yeah, so I'm an ethical hacker. I mean, um, I made lots of mistakes, I have lots of regrets about stuff I did in the past. I caused a lot of headaches, headaches for the phone company and system administrators around the planet. And nowadays, what I do is I do the same thing. You know, it's kind of interesting that uh, it's like Pablo Escobar becoming a pharmacist, <laughs> right? So, <laughs> so I, I do the kind of the same thing, you know, like, but, Companies, the only difference is I have authorization. They give me authorization to break into their systems physically, technically, by manipulating their people through a technique called social engineering, testing their uh, voice over IP, uh, their wireless. And basically, when companies hire my team, I, I bring in the best people in the world to work on each different project, kind of like Mission Impossible. I set up a team per project. And uh, if we're allowed to test web applications and or allowed to use social engineering, our success rate is 100%. Right, so you know, it's the, the sad truth is, it's much harder to protect your networks and your systems than it is to break into them. Because as a hacker, I only need to find one hole to compromise you, and as a company to protect your information assets, you have to cover all those holes, which is a lot more challenging. So what my company does is we try to identify all the holes so our clients could plug those before the real bad guys exploit them yeah. and become the next Sony. So we spent the morning here um, really stepping ourselves not too far into the, into the future, but you know, talking about self-driving cars, drones, um, you know, our connected living rooms even, robots in our homes. Uh, Everything's going to be everything connected. Yeah, everything connected. It's scary with the cars because cars are getting hacked now. Oh, okay. Wireless, you know, where you could, uh, you know, uh, uh, pretty much control the brakes on vehicles remotely and wirelessly. So... You know, and these talks have just recently been, you know, within the last year or two. Right. And it's pretty scary because a lot of, you know, a lot of companies that build automobiles or build appliances for the home or whatever, they don't think about security in the beginning of the development because they're interested in, they, they're innovative, they have a new product that's going to make the world better, make our lives easier. Right. And they're not thinking about the security aspects. And then when they, the product goes to market and then some security researchers go, oh, I wonder... I wonder if I could hack that, and they do it. Then that company now has to go back and, and fix the problem. So it's the band-aid approach, right. because businesses aren't thinking about security in the initial development of the product, unless it's a security product. All right, so everybody here has, uh, I'm pretty certain every single person in this room has a smartphone, probably have you know, uh, at least one or two other connected devices. You said when we walked out here, you said, if I've done my research on you, then I've shut off Wi-Fi, I've shut off Bluetooth, you know, I practically turned the phone off. Um, you're going to show us some, some... Yeah, I'll show you some cool demos. Like, imagine, if you, how many people here uh, have uh, iPhones or use AT&T? Oh, Quite iPhone. a few. Uh, so automatically, your phone, unless you go into the settings and know where to go, your phone will automatically connect to any SSID, which is your Wi-Fi access point called ATT Wi-Fi, because it's convenient, it makes it easy. And I think AT&T probably partnered with Apple, so that would be the default feature. Well, what a hacker can do is they could use a device, and this will take us, I have to power this up, but before I power it up, let me show you what it is. One moment. I'll so what this device is, it's a Wi-Fi pineapple, and this you could buy for 100 bucks. It's basically has two 2.4 gigahertz radios, and what this, what this device does is I could weaponize it so one radio in here is AT&T Wi-Fi. The other I can connect out to the internet, but, it, but when you have two radios together, there's interference. So I'm using this port, I'm tethering just a T-Mobile access point to it. And what I can do is I could set this SSID to AT&T Wi-Fi. And when your devices automatically connect to this device, I can now attack you. And I'm gonna show you how, for example, on my Mac, how you're connected here, you go to a, a, any bank, and what happens is about 30 seconds later, after you put in your credentials, an Adobe Flash update pops up. And when you install that update, I now own your machine. So I'll show that quick demo. It's pretty scary and real and easy to do. But this will take a second because I have to power all this up. So this is the setup. Now, normally we have external battery packs 
that we could use with this. I have it plugged into uh, you know, AC here because I couldn't f actually find the cord. So I just power up. So it's actually portable. You can carry this device in a backpack. So imagine your phone associating with um, you know, a device like this and exploiting you. Or, but I'm going to do a computer demo because if you haven't jailbroken your iOS device, iOS is Apple, iPad, iPhone, it's pretty secure. When you jailbreak it, you basically remove the protection that uh, applications have to be signed by Apple. Android uh, devices, they're, they're, they're much easier to compromise. So the I think the best secure device is iOS, not jailbroken, for mobile. So let me go ahead and uh, if we could put the, this Mac, Mac 1 on, say, the right screen and Mac 4 on the other, that would be great. And then let me go over here to a control panel. This is my dashboard of who I'm going to you know, attack. And what I'm going to do is set up uh, the Adobe on uh, Citibank. And what we're going to do is we're going to be able to see credentials as well. So let me put this here. Credentials is you know, usernames and passwords. So th this is my control. And this is on a different computer talking to a system in the cloud. So this is the hacker's computer. This is the victim running you know, the you know, Mac OS X. And what I'm going to do is hopefully this device is turned on. I'm going to connect, and we're going to see what access points are available. Can you see this on the screen clearly, this Mac? Can you see ATT Wi-Fi here? See that? I'm going to connect to it. And you guys will do it automatically, usually. Just let me make sure I have a connectivity here. Perfect. So what we're going to do is I'm going to first weaponize the device. I'll let you see what I'm doing. Kevin123 is my password, in case I know all of you want to know it. And then I'm going to begin my tool to, to begin the spoofing process. And this is all set up pre, you know, pre-set up. I'm just showing you what I do, you know, um, kind of out of the box. So I'm basically running a shell script. And this is basically taking all the domains I want to spoof. Let me, let me also clear, a, in case I saved any stuff, clear my browser. Ah. OK. Takes a second because I'm spoofing lots of domains, uh, every major bank and some system. So it actually takes a moment. And then once my script runs, basically I'm allowed to steal credentials from like any major bank. Well, it's pretending to be a bank, it's not the real bank. And also um, inject JavaScript exploitation like a fake uh, Adobe update. So hold on one second. See if this is still running. Usually it might take uh, 60 seconds or so. What other demo is on that list that maybe I could show in the, in the uh, meantime as this is weaponizing? You're to talk to us about um, the IVR attack and the PDF. OK, let me show the IVR attack as this is weaponizing. Yeah. So how many of you, you heard about phishing attacks, right? Where you'll um, receive an email. It will obviously be from eBay, PayPal. And it will obviously be a, a fake, right? So they want your password or a credential. And this is all old school, right? And then we went up to Skype attacks, where you'd get a Skype message that your machine's infected. It wouldn't work on any of you, but it might work on your grandparents, right? Or some colleague at work that's not technically astute. And then now they have integrated voice response. So when you call your bank, your airline, uh, your credit card company, you never get a live person you always get the integrated voice response system. So what hackers have done is what they would do is they would use open source asterisk, which is a PBX, open source. They'd call like their favorite bank. They'd record all the voice prompts. And they'd create a clone system. So then they'd use, they'd sign up for a voice over IP number on the internet, which cost a dollar. And they would spam users. And in the spam email, it would say, we detected there was some fraud on your account. Please contact one of our customer service reps. And they'd have the toll-free number. The victims would call the toll-free number, thinking it's their bank. They put in their credentials, their account number, their PIN, or whatever. And then, it would, then the system would say, we're sorry, we detected a problem with your account. And they'd be transferred to customer service. And we're transferring you to customer service. And they'd be put on hold, music on hold forever. Because it was, a, it was a decoy system. It wasn't a real system that the victim was calling into. It was a hacker system. So I thought, what's a better way to do this where the victim could call into the bank, actually access all their financial in information, but the bad guy could also get all your data. So I'm going to show you a quick attack called the IVR spoofing attack. And what we'll do is we'll do this with, um, do this with Chase Bank. Let me see. 
So I want you to watch the screen here called the Spy Bridge. And what we're going to do is give the bank a call. Does anybody have a Chase credit card I can borrow? <laughs> no? Every time I do a, a speaking engagement, nobody wants to volunteer their credit card. I don't know why. OK, I'll use mine. So I have a Southwest Visa card here. And by the way, for this demo, please put your cameras and pens away, because it's my real card number here. So we're going to call into the bank. And I want you to watch the screen as I do so. Watch the screen. If we could put the microphone on this, that'd be great. Welcome to Rapid Rewards Credit Card Services from Chase. Please enter your full 16-digit credit card account number. I'll put in something false first. So you see it's capturing digits. And this is the real bank. We're sorry. The number you entered was not recognized. Please enter your full credit card account number. OK. Stop writing that down. So there's the card number. Now it's going to check and authenticate me. We're sorry. The number you entered was not recognized. Uh, Please enter your full credit oh, card Oh, I typed it wrong. Number. Sorry about that. Unless it's the speakerphone. I could always try with the cell if that doesn't work. Let me see where's One that. moment while we connect you with a okay. customer service. Okay, so I'm going to do it. The Sometimes the speakerphone doesn't work good. It. So what I'm going to do is just do it. If we could put this audio up, I'm just going to call the same number on the cell phone. Sorry about that. And it worked deal earlier. So we're going to call back into the same bank. And we're going to get the same prompt. So watch the screen. Do you hear the audio coming out of the audio here? From the computer, computer audio. Welcome to Rapid okay, Rewards. Okay, you can turn that up. Card services from Chase. Please enter the last four digits of your credit card account number. I'm just going to put in one, two, three, four. We're sorry, the number you entered was not recognized. Please enter your full 16-digit credit card account number. I'm going to put that in. I should ask to verify identity. Please enter your zip code. I'll put in a fake zip code. Which is one the zip code you entered does not match the information on file. Please enter the zip code of the primary address on the account. So I'll put the real zip code. To access the main menu at any time, press star. Your current balance is? I don't want to know it. So. As you can see, I captured the credit card details the, you know, and, and the zip code. And what I did is a man in the middle attack. So when the victim calls that toll-free number, it actually goes to my system, and my system calls out to the real bank. So this is a true man in the middle. So if you're transacting speaking credentials or touch-toning them in through DTMF, I could capture them and put them on the display over here. So that's kind of what how phishing has evolved into doing IVR phishing. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, no, there's not any companies that came out with a way to mitigate this attack. So, this, so some kid in Starbucks could do this you know, all day and night. So now, let me, it looks like the spoofing thing finally uh, did its job. So that's weaponizing the attack over here. And what we're going to do is now we're going to bring up a web browser. And we're going to go over here to Citibank. And Citibank will come up. Let's make sure it's on the display correctly. Mm -hmm. So this is the victim on, that's connected to AT&T Wi-Fi that's actually going through my weaponized pineapple. So then what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and pick bank account. And now we're going to put any, you know, uh, strictly mobile. I hacked you. Okay, 
I spelled that right. We're going to sign in, assuming those are real credentials. I'll show you how we capture them later. So let's assume that logs in because I'm not going to use real credentials. We'll, and we'll pay attention because in 30 seconds, the fake Adobe Flash update is going to load here. But if we go over here onto this Mac, I'll go ahead and refresh my panel. And if we look over here, what we did is we ca captured the username here, strictly mobile. Make that bigger for you. Excuse me. Come on. So we got the username strictly mobile. And it, what it does is it does a JavaScript keyboard, you know, basically JavaScript keylogger. And then here I got the password, I hacked you. So here I was able to steal the credentials from, from the victim. And now we go over, now let me connect over here. Second. Now I want you to pay attention to this. We got the Adobe Flash update here. So that's the weaponized attack. Over here is the hacker machine. So as the hacker, we want to take over this computer. So you'll pay attention to both sides for a second. I'll go ahead and install the Adobe Flash update. Install. Come on. Slow. It goes to adobe.com. I go ahead and it says, you know, to, you know, to hit the update button. So we do the update. It's downloading the update. And as we can see here, if you look at the bottom of the screen, here's the update coming. It has about 12 seconds left. It's coming from adobe.com. So just let that finish, five seconds. So now the victim uh, has downloaded the Adobe update. And, and it doesn't pop up automatically. The you know, victim it ex explains that you have to open it. And this is really how Adobe works. You open up the file. Now, I want you to watch this computer as I click Install Adobe Flash Update and hit Open. Right on this computer, you see some activity. And what this did is right now, I was able to compromise this computer, and I was able to get a shell, uh, what we call a reverse shell, to the system over here. And let me bring that up for you, make it a little bigger. And what that means is now I'm the hacker now I've compromised this machine once they've you know, clicked to install the update. Let me make this bigger for you. I'll make it maybe 110 so you can see it. Yeah. Make it 90. All right. Sorry about that. I'm trying to get the right uh, size for you. KD5 works. So what I can now do is connect to that session. And now I have a shell. If I do a W, it's logged in under the user Kevin. But as a hacker, I want to get root. I want to compromise that machine. So now what we do is once we use social engineering to get access to the machine, now we'll use a technical exploit to do what we call privilege escalation to take control over the complete system. So let me show you something here. So there's a little uh, script. Rather than downloading it from the internet, I already put it on the system. And here we uh, have a file here called rootme. It does not have any privileges associated with it. And I run this script. And this is a new vulnerability that was just pu published uh, for Mac OS X. And, they only, and Apple hasn't fixed it. And what I'm going to do is create, make it create an executable called pwned by just running this Python script. It did it. So if we look at that file called pwned, I hope you can see this. What we have here is owned by root. And the third letter is an S. That means now it's set UID root. So now that's a program that runs with root privileges. I run the program. And here I am, I'm root, right here. So now I've taken you through the attack where a victim, this machine automatically connects to AT&T Wi-Fi. They're fooled into thinking they need to install an Adobe Flash update. They do it. I get a non-privileged shell. 
on the hacker computer, then I use a technical vulnerability to elevate myself up to root, and now I have complete ownership over that system. So that's how a real attack works. And so now you have to think about what public Wi-Fi are you going to connect to now? Now, let's say you're already connected. What I could do is I could do a type of an attack that tells your computer, disconnect from that uh, um, wireless access point and connect to mine, because mine's stronger and has the same name. So there you go. And so once you're in, now what can you do? I have full control of the machine. I can upload, download files. I could turn on the webcam. I basically, once I have root, root is like system uh, administrator, it's like administrator under Windows, I have complete and full control over this Mac. Does that make sense to you? you make it, yeah. So Everyone's disconnecting from Wi-Fi right now. Yeah. So if you want to go ahead and connect to AT&T Wi-Fi for me, we could try it on your devices. No. But um, so this is how this attack works. I'm going to unplug this anyway right now so it doesn't automatically, you know, obviously don't automatically associate with it. But this is called, this is called a, an injection attack. The NSA does the same thing on a much broader scale because they actually break into your ISPs. So now once they have control over the network of the internet service provider, when you're going to LinkedIn or wherever, they could actually inject their own code into your, into your page or your session and actually do the same type of thing on a much broader scale. So um, how, do you, how do we defend against this? Um, what I, I don't connect to open Wi-Fi networks. And when I do, the first thing I do is VPN. So I use a VPN client. And what that does is it encrypts your communication from your, from your telephone device all the way up to your VPN provider. You have to trust the VPN provider. And, uh, and that prevents somebody, if you initially do that immediately upon connecting to the network, if I try to do this attack against you, it wouldn't work. Right? And, you know, um, uh, because I couldn't inject into the session. That's the reason why. Um, it's actually in, in a tunnel. So I'd be really, you know, you have to be really concerned with wireless because you might be connecting to a rogue or a malicious wireless access point. And these are attacks that we actually do in our pen testing and that work time in and time out every day. Okay. So let's shift from uh, electronic penetration to physical penetration. Okay. Because you've uh, said that um, you know, part of um, uh, you know, accessing our secure world is also walking in the front door. Sure. Like I recently tested a large financial institution and as part of the test, they wanted to see if we can, our team could get into their data center, because that's essentially the keys of the kingdom. Does anyone in here have access cards for your company? They're usually you know, thin, white access cards. They're called proximity cards. Usually, the manufacturer is hid. Uh, do I see a hand over there? And, or I don't know if it's a camera. But uh, I, I'm sure many of you use the same cards. Do any so, of you have hid cards? Somebody put their hand up here. Huh? No. Where? You have one? You have a hid card? You wanna, we, we might try to use your hid card as a demo if you don't mind. <laughs> oh, come on, come on. This is, this is safe. It might work, it might not work. We could just give it a shot. Come on. <laughs> because I want to become you for the day. <laughs> where do you, <laughs> turn, take your badge off so nobody knows where you work after the demo's done. <laughs> okay, here's, here's one right here. All right. So hold on, let me set this up. So we, what we want to do is just put, if we could put the Mac 1 up only. Come on up. And let me connect to my head reader. You're One brave. second. You're very brave, Eric. I get my, uh, you have two. I do. Okay. One second. So what we have here is this is an HID low prox, uh, it's a prox card. It's low frequency. These are HID readers, HID. Uh, it's like one of, and when you pass the card through, you'll see that we get the card ID and the site ID. If I get the card ID or site ID, I can buy software over the internet from China and basically clone the card. And once I clone the card, I'm essentially you and have the same privileges as you do in the company. So as an attacker, I want to get your credentials so I can now clone the card and become you to gain access to whatever doors that you're allowed access to. So let's just try, I don't know if yours is a high or low, but we'll give it a shot. Yeah, so there's your card. That's kind of cool. So what we're going to do is I'm going to become him. I'm going to steal his credentials. Now, normally, we wouldn't have this reader. You know, I'm not going to ask him for the card and show it. But I want to prove to you 
that I'm able to steal the data. So what we'll do, show you this device as the first step. This is a device you probably don't want to carry through TSA, <laughs> looking like this. It's a little bit suspicious. But what this is, is this is an antenna. Can, this we, is, can, we, can we get a camera on this so everyone can see what this is? OK. Got there. OK. This is a battery pack. This is the Proxmark. And this is the antenna. And this, unfortunately, you have to get kind of close to the card. But you don't carry this around, and as people have their cards on their hip or around their neck, you know, or in their wallet, you don't carry this around. That's going to be like, what's that guy have, right? They're going to back off. So what you do is you just conceal it. A little laptop bag. Yeah. That doesn't look so threatening, does it? You know, you go to the smoking area of a company. Hi, I'm Kevin Mitnick. Nice to meet you. And as you're looking the person in the eye, you're getting the antenna close enough to their card within three inches. Right? As they're at Starbucks on lunch break, coming into the office, going in and out for starting the day, lunch breaks at the end of the day, and it's quite easy to get the information. So what we're going to do is I'm going to demo this to you. Sometimes these connectors are a little bit weird. I'm going to show you the, the hard way and then the easy way. So I'm going to weaponize this device. Let me arm it. And I don't have to show you this. It's just a bunch of funny lights. So right now it's armed. So if I put this into the bag and get close enough to Eric's card, I'm going to be able to steal his credentials. But we're, I'm just going to do it out of the pocket. Is this the same? Do you have two of the same card? Yeah. Oh, OK. So we'll do both of these. So we got two different cards. So we're, do, we're only going to steal one. So imagine I get close enough to, the, to him. Sorry, this antenna fell out. So I get close enough, and now it, read, it actually read the card. And now this device essentially will now spoof his card. This device is now the same as his card. So now if I put that device up to the reader, it's the same. So now this is essentially Eric's card, right? Now once I am able to read the card, I actually can clone it and can become him. But you're thinking to yourself, there's no way I'm going to let Kevin um, a two feet. For, you know, I'm not going to get within two feet of the guy. You know, when we're out here at uh, dinner last night, you know, people are mingling their close. You know, but you're not, you're not going to invade somebody's personal space because that's weird. But we have a solution to that. So you saw this device. Now, this is that device on steroids. Now, this is the baby you put in the backpack. This is another device you probably don't want to carry through airport security, unless you have the batteries out. This is actually a HID reader that's long range. And what this device has is I weaponized it with a micro SD card. So every card read I do will store it on the card. So I can walk around with my backpack, and maybe a tape recorder, and basically, oh, I'm walking by the guy from Qualys. I'm walking by the guy from IBM. I'm walking, by, you know, and actually be able to sync the card reads to this device. And this reads it from three feet away and puts it on the SD card, so I'll show you that. What we're going to do is we're going to hopefully put this on the document camera. Until, let's see if we could see that. If we could stick the document camera up on one screen would be great. So, is that kind of, it's OK. I'm going to turn it off so you see it in the off position. Let it initialize. I want to just use one of the, it's going to confuse it if I, let me just take one off. So now, let's see how far we can read the card. So watch where it says car, uh, card initialized. And we're just passing up this high, three feet away. And at the hex on the bottom is the bit stream I need to get the card ID and the facility ID. So I could just walk around with this. Thank you so much, Eric. I walk around with this. I get the card ID, site ID. It takes five minutes to clone another card. And now I'm Eric. And now I can get to every door that he has access to. And this not only works for low prox cards, but also the iClass we've hacked, and Indala, MyFair. And so you have to think about, just because you have an access card doesn't mean an attacker can't figure out a way to steal those cred credentials to become you. Wow. Yeah. So uh, Kevin, the third category is social engineering, which I find very interesting. I'd love you to tell us about how you hacked Motorola. Wow. 
So this is a hack from, you know, in fact, I have to get a couple props here. So this is back in 1992. I'm living in Denver, Colorado. And I'm not living under the name of Kevin Mitnick at the time. I was living under the name of Eric Weiss. Why Eric Weiss? Because that's the real name of Harry Houdini. I thought I had a sense of humor, but I learned later the FBI did not. <laughs> Story for another day. Do you guys remember the Microtech Ultralight? This was like the, well, Star Trek communicator, right? I don't know if this works. This is like the iPhone 7 of the 1990s, right? <laughs> really, everybody loved these things. So because I was fascinated with, with cell phones, because it was a computer and a radio, I wanted to get the source code to the actual device. So I worked at a law firm in Denver, and I asked my supervisor if I could leave a little bit early. I left early. I get to the bottom floor, and I call, I power up a cell phone, incidentally not under Kevin Mitnick either, and I call 1-800 directory assistance, and I ask for a Motorola. I get a number, I call the number, I get a receptionist, and I go, hi, I'm looking for somebody from the, for the Microtech Ultralight project. And the nice receptionist told me that all cellular phone development was handled out of Schaumburg, Illinois. She goes, would you like that number? I go, sure. She gives me the number, I call it, I get a different receptionist. I go, hi, I'm looking for the project manager of the Microtech. So I'm transferred around two, three, five, by the eighth time of transfers, this is over a period of like a half hour I'm talking to other people. I'm now talking to the vice president for all of Motorola, uh, all of, uh, Motorola Mobility. And I go, hey, this is, this is Rick over in Arlington Heights, because I learned during my previous transfers that there was an R&D facility in Arlington Heights. And so I figured I'd better use a name this time. And, uh, and I asked him, I go, I'm trying, to, I'm trying to locate the person that handles the microtac. And he goes, that's Pam. She works for me. Would you like her extension? I go, yes, gives me the extension. He goes, well, can I help you with anything? I go, no, 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 I'll talk to Pam. So I call Pam's extension, but I don't get her. I get her outgoing reading on her voicemail, and she told her callers that she just left on a two-week vacation, the date she's returning, and if you need any help whatsoever, please call Alicia on extension, blah, blah, blah. So who's my next call to? Alicia. So I call Alicia. She answers, and they go, hi, Alicia, this is Rick over in Arlington Heights. Did Pam leave on vacation yet? Oh, she has, because before she left, she was going to send me the source code to the Microtac Ultralight. Then by this time, I'm walking. I lived about a 15-minute walk on 16th, 16th Street in Denver, from, and this was like 15 minutes from the law firm I was working at, and it was snow, snowing that day, and I was pressing this phone to my ear really hard as I'm walking down the street, because horns are honking, it's traffic, because I wanted to have that office environment. Background, not uh, cars honking. So I'm pressing it to my ear in about 10 minutes from my house, and she goes, no, but what version do you want? And I didn't even think about the version numbers. This was all extemporaneous. And I go, how about the latest and the greatest? So she's typing on her computer, and about five minutes later, she comes back and says, Rick, I found the, I found the source code. Um, however, there's a problem. I go, what's the problem? She goes, there are hundreds of directories, and within each directory, there are hundreds of files. And I said, do you know how to use tar and gzip? That's like WinZip under Windows, when you can take a whole bunch of files and make it into one archive. And she goes, no. I said, would you like to learn? <laughs> and she goes, yes. So I became her instructor for the hour. I taught her how to use tar and gzip, and at the end of the lesson, we had a single four megabyte file, which was the source code I wanted to look at. So my next question to her is, do you know how to use FTP? And she goes, oh yeah, that's file transfer program. I go, yeah, precisely. And I'm walking down the street. I never had this, again, this is extemporaneous. I couldn't tell her, connect to my system at badguyhacker at colorado.edu. I couldn't give her that, so I had a good knack for remembering IP addresses. So I said, okay, try to connect to this IP address and I'll give you an account to log into. So she connects and it times out twice, three times. Then she goes, Rick, she goes, I'm gonna talk to my security manager about what you're asking me to do, I'll be right back. I go, no, wait, wait, wait. And I was already on hold, because that's the last person I wanted to talk to, last person. So I'm on hold and I'm almost, you know, now five minutes from home, and it's taking a long time. I'm getting a little bit nervous that they're going to hook up a tape recorder to the call, and that's going to be Exhibit A. 
for a future court case. So, so I'm a little bit nervous. When she comes back, she goes, Rick, uh-huh. She goes, I talked to my security manager about what you're asking me to do, and that IP address you gave us is outside of Motorola's campus. I go, uh-huh. Notice I'm not saying words. It is, uh-huh. And um, she goes, my, my security manager said we can't transfer a file outside of Motorola unless we use a special proxy server, and I don't have a username or password to log into it. I go, OK, well, thanks anyway. You know, Thank you for your time. And she goes, but wait, wait. I got some great news for you. I go, what is it? She goes, my security manager gave me his personal username and password <laughs> so I could log into the proxy server and transfer you the file. So by the time I put the key into the front door of my apartment, I had the source code for the MicroTAC Ultralight there for my review. So that's kind of a lesson that a good gift to Gab, a few, minutes on the t a few minutes on the telephone can get the keys to the kingdom of a major company. Um, and Motorola is a great company. They make great technology, right? Uh, they make security technologies, but it goes to show you that the human factor is often the weakest link. And you have a demonstration for us of how you can socially engineer um, a hack? Uh, well, what if I were to send you a, what type of file would you open in an email? Word, I mean, do you like open Office Docs, Excel, Word, PowerPoint? What do you feel safe with? PDFs? Anybody? PDF, right? Everyone feels safe with a PDF file, right? So let me show you what happens when I send my PDF to you. <laughs> All right, so what we're going to do for this demo is I, I want the uh, computer one on one screen, and then if we could put uh, computer two on the other. And what I'm going to connect to here, hold on a second, I'll try to make this bigger for you. A second. Let's make sure this is set up properly. Let me make, again, I'll, let me enlarge this to maybe uh, 120. Then I'll explain it. So this system here that I'm running on my Mac, actually this computer is in the Amazon cloud. It's not in this room. It's in, it's in somewhere in one of their data centers. This is the hacker's computer. This over here that we'll do as a Dell machine, Windows 7, I just updated the patches this morning and running the latest version of McAfee antivirus all up to date. By the way, McAfee is good at making videos, but not antivirus. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Never mind, if you don't get that one. So, <laughs> so what we're going to do is we have a file here called nomalwarehere.pdf, and we should have that on this screen. Right here. So just by the name, you could trust it. It's clean. But you don't trust me. Let's ch check it with the AV. So this is your, your AV gateway. So we're going to scan for threats. And we're going to continue. And we can see that nothing is found. Right here. It's clean. So now we're going to go ahead and open it. And I'm not going to log into the email. That just takes too much time. It's just easier just to put it on the desktop. So I'm going to open it. And how this attack is working is it's going to appear to freeze for a moment. Let's see if it opens. It's taking a long time. OK, it opens it. And what it does is it kind of freezes for a moment because of the way this exploit is working. How it's working, for those techies in the audience, is it's spraying all over memory code that I want to run as the bad guy. It's called what we call a heap spray. That's the technical term. And then what my code is going to try to do is jump to my instructions to run my arbitrary code that will install a rootkit on this machine. So if it successfully installs, what we have over here, as you see it's been hacked, is now we have the Trojan that's installed. So if we look at the process list over here or any files, it's clean, but I completely have the machine backdoored. And this Trojan is being, this machine over here is compromised and it's putting, then the Trojan's connecting to the, probably the data center in Seattle at Amazon. So let me show you what this Trojan could do. So as the bad guy, I could upload and download files. I could modify the registry. If there's any stored passwords, let me look at over here. Let's see if there's any stored passwords there. Um, there's a VPN password sitting there, an old VPN password. 
Um, I could get the browser and these stored passwords and Safari, well, not, you know, people don't use Safari and Windows, but mostly Internet Explorer, Firefox, Chrome. But my favorite features are spy features. Did you know when you have a laptop, a Trojan could turn your microphone on so your computer is now a room bug? So essentially all the conversation in the room, the attacker can listen to. But what about watching you through your webcam? Isn't that kind of creepy? But it can be done. So what the attacker could do is enable the webcam feature. And uh, let me see if I go make the a little bit smaller here, sorry. So I could click on it, and then I'll enlarge it. So we're going to start the capture, go back up. And what happens is on this computer here, the webcam secretly turns on, and I could see every move you make. So moral of the story is if your webcam light pops on and you're not doing anything, <laughs> Something bad is likely going on, right? <laughs> yeah. What's the solution? Low tech, piece of tape. I've seen it done. Did you put a so, piece of tape on yours? No, because no. I'm unhackable. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Everybody's hackable. But um, I, if I saw the light, but you know, actually, if you can have you a sophisticated the, attack, can you, you can disable the light. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, but anyway, so now as the bad guy, I have complete control of that machine because you simply opened up a PDF file. Oh, and by the way, if, it, uh, if you guys want to copy my presentation, I have it for you on PDF. Okay. <laughs> just okay. kidding, just kidding. So, the, so that's, um, let me just uninstall this Trojan off the box and we can continue. Go ahead with the... Uh, so Kevin, um, j I, you know, j just to wrap up, it, it, it's, um, I want to talk a little bit about nation state um, hacking okay. and you know, some of the things that we've seen lately. And of course, it kind of strikes me as I've learned of, um, in preparation for this, learned about this whole notion of um, uh, social engineering and the manipulation and so forth. But the, the, the largest hack in the history of the US government involved a guy walking out the front door with an armful of documents. Yeah, can you believe right? that? I think that's the biggest security failure in US history, is having a guy entrusted with all the NSA files, basically copying those files covertly and walking right out the door. I mean, I can't think of any security failure that's bigger. Yeah. Can you? Yeah. I can't. So, so talk to us a little bit about you know, North Korea hacking Sony, the Russians hacking the White House and the State Department. And, um, and even you know, as we think about ourselves with all of our magical devices and soon our self-driving cars and the drones picking our food up and all of that, that sort of thing, are we safer now, are, are we less safe now than we were you know, yesterday and, and what's gonna happen tomorrow? Well, the, the concern is, is uh, security companies are very innovative at coming out with products to help mitigate risk, to protect all of you from being compromised. But at the same time, the hackers are having conferences and meetings just like we are here today, thinking of how to do exploitation. Usually exploitation for pen testing, which is ethical hacking, but there could be people in that audience that aren't there for ethical purposes, that are learning the skills and honing those skills to be good at compromise. Now, Sony, for example, you know, I was interviewed you know, several times for this, and I'm really skeptical that it was North Korean hackers. I mean, we're just relying on the government saying we have confidential information that you know, says they're behind it. I think how they'd be behind it is maybe funding it. I don't think they actually did it, but I'm unsure. But I think if I was hacking Sony myself as part of a legitimate pen test, I'd be able to compromise them too. Their headquarters is in Culver City, California. You probably could simply walk into the door and plug something in. They have so much real estate on the, on the internet, so many different attack uh, points and vectors, you know, web applications, network, social engineering, one of their thousands of employees. It's just an easy target and it doesn't surprise me that Sony was compromised, not in the least. And in fact, it doesn't surprise me or any other security experts. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, what, you know, what, I, what I think was significant about that Sony case is the attackers took all this confidential data and put it out in, uh, for the public. And it's interesting that when this first happened, there was no mention of the movie The Interview. It's only when there was speculation that the interview might have you know, uh, instigated this attack. Then, the, then it all of a sudden became about the interview, if you look at the timing of this whole thing. But what was scary is one reporter shared a lot of the Sony files with me to get my input on what I thought about the attack and you know what was Sony's real state of security. And 
uh, the CEO of the company, uh, Mike, uh, Michael Layton, maybe Michael Layton, if I re recall the name, and his password, his domain user password, was Sony ML, his initials, followed by the number three. I could tell you when he has to change his password again, it would probably be Sony ML4. <laughs> right? So really uh, sloppy password management that I see a lot, you know, not only with Sony, but with other companies. But it's, uh, it, again, you know, um, what Sony really needed to do, you know, in, in my mind, is hire expert penetration testers to look at all the different, you know, look at their attack surface, figure out what their vulnerabilities are, close it up, harden their systems inside to reduce that attack service, and spend money on prevention rather than dealing with the aftermath of remediating uh, this huge problem. Yeah. All right. Listen, it's been really great talking to you. Thank you for showing us these demos. I think you scared the heck out of everybody. I have, I have a gift for everybody that sees me after at some point in time, mm -hmm. and I'll show it to you. I don't have, uh, if you want one. What do we have to do for it? You don't have to do anything. So some people already have it. This is my business card. And what's cool about my business card is not only has my contact info, but it actually has utility. What it is is it's a breakout lockpick set. So you break these devices off my business card, and if you learn a little bit about lockpicking, you can open up locks. So if you ever lock yourself out of your home, your apartment, your bathroom, your suite, think of Kevin Mitnick and I'll open the door for you. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay.